All right, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kristen Motti, a programs librarian here at the Central Library of the Boston Public Library. Tonight's conversation with Reese Jones about his new book, White Borders, the History of Race and Immigration in the United States from Chinese Exclusion to the Border Wall is presented in partnership with the Norman B. Leventhal Map, Cent Map and Education Center here at the BPL, as well as the State Library of Massachusetts. Our featured author and moderator will join us in just a moment. First, though, a few, just a few small items of housekeeping and a bit about our author and moderator. In this Zoom webinar space, your cameras and microphones are muted. Closed captioning is available and you can turn it on or off by the, close, by the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Questions for tonight's guest author can be typed into the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen at any time. And there will be time toward the end of our hour together where audience questions will be taken. To so buy your copy of White Borders from our partner bookseller for tonight's talk, Trident, please visit the link in the chat. It'll be put there in just a moment. There are some signed copies available. And if you use the coupon code BPLSHIP, there's free media mail shipping nationwide. Also check your local library if you'd like to borrow a copy. Tonight's guest author, Reese Jones, is a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow and a professor in and chair of the Department of Geography and Environment at the University of Hawaii. He has researched immigration for over 20 years and is also the author of Border Walls and Violent Borders. He has served as an editor for four books and written over 20 journal, journal articles. He is currently editor-in-chief of, of the journal Geopolitics. He joins us this evening, which is morning for him from Honolulu. Before we meet Reese Jones, there, here is Beth Carol Horrocks from the State Library of Massachusetts to welcome on behalf of the State Library and introduce tonight's moderator, Garrett Dash Nelson. Beth, welcome. Thank you, Kristen, and hello, everyone. Just a very quick hello from the State Library of Massachusetts, where I am the head of special collections. We're very glad to be here tonight with our partners from the Boston Public Library and the Leventhal Map Center at the BPL for this virtual discussion of Reese Jones's new work. Since the topic has a, has a local and a very universal reach and it fits in very well with our own library holdings and interests. So we know that all the members of the State Library of Massachusetts author talk community will learn a lot tonight from a perfect author to illustrate so well a topic that we all need to know more about. So I'd like to introduce before we get started, uh, Garrett Dash Nelson, who will be discussing Reese Jones's book with him tonight. So Garrett Dash Nelson is the president and head curator at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. He's a historical geographer who studies political ideas about place and community. He also works on critical approaches to geospatial analysis and the digital humanities. So Garrett, over to you. Thanks, Beth, and thanks, Kristen, for hosting. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, just a few notes welcoming from the Leventhal Map and Education Center. We're an independent uh, nonprofit in a, a permanent relationship with the Boston Public Library. We care for about a quarter million geographic objects like, like maps um, and many other materials in the BPL's collections. But most importantly, we're interested in questions about people, places, the natural environment, and the geographic world. And for that reason, it's really a thrill to get to be in conversation today. Uh, with a very important uh, voice bringing con uh, quite, uh, geographic themes to urgent contemporary issues, and that is Reese Jones of the University of Hawaii. So it's nice to see you, Reese. Hi, it's it's nice to be here. Thanks so much, Garrett, for having me and for everyone at the Boston Public Library, the State Library, the Leventhal Map Center for, for organizing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're so glad that you could join us and that uh, technology can make it possible for you not to have to fly quite all the way around the world uh, to get here to Boston. Of course, you have a story that connects places like Hawaii to places like Boston and places much further than that across the globe. Um, I want to remind the audience that you're welcome to ask a question at any time. 
Uh, we'll be trying to have as much of an interactive uh, audience discussion as possible over Zoom in the latter half of the conversation. We'll start with a couple of questions um, between myself and Reese, um, but I do want to urge you uh, to engage if you hear anything that uh, Professor Jones says that you'd like to follow up more on, uh, questions about his book if you've had a chance to read it already, or questions about the topic uh, if you're just diving into this for the first time. So Reese, I wanna start out with a broad question about both how you came to write the book and how you came to frame it. Before White Borders, you were already a, a kind of important voice in helping us understand where borders come from, what they are and how they operate through political systems. Uh, but this book is really an impressive historical dive into the, the past of the United States stretching back more than two centuries. How did you come to think that you needed to investigate a kind of longer historical arc of borders in order to understand them? And what do we learn about our borders of today by putting it in that kind of historical context? Yeah, so White Borders is my third book. And so it really does follow on the, the previous two books. I wrote a book about border walls that came out in 2012. And then my second book, Violent Borders, which looks at uh, migrant deaths around the world and thinks about why countries like the US, but in the European Union, Australia, around the world are, are making borders um, so much more enforced than they have been in the past. And so I tell the historical story of that about how how it's about protecting privileges and excluding other people of the world from access to those privileges in those places. Um, that book came out in October of 2016. So I watched the Trump campaign kind of in, in the months before the book came out and, and as it came out, um, take a lot of these issues that I had been studying for years, the, the border wall specifically, um, and talk about them in these very racialized terms. Um, and so in my previous books, I don't really think that much about the issue of race when thinking about border walls or migrant deaths. I mean, it's there in the background, um, but it's not the focus of either of those books. And so I decided that I needed to go back and look at this in a little bit more depth and um, take my work, which had been previously focused on borders themselves, um, and think about the laws that surround them and the, the history of immigration laws. Um, and so I went back and looked at the US's immigration laws and tried to understand whether the way that Trump and his campaign talked about immigration was out of the ordinary. Was this something completely new? Because it, it felt that way, I think, to a lot of people at the moment. Or was it something that had a long historical trajectory in the US? Um, and what I found is that certainly fits well within the history of the relationship between race and immigration um, in the US. So pull that apart for us a little bit. How are race and immigration controls related to one another? Has race always been a part of the United States immigration regime? Um, for those of us who think about immigration as a question of maps and borders, it may seem like a, merely a question of inside and outside, right? Immigration controls whomever is on the outside from getting inside. But how does race refract through that question of, of controlling that, that territorial line? Yeah. Um, well, I think in order to, to answer that question, we really need to, to go back to the beginning and think about um, U.S. immigration laws, because as I did some research on this, I found some things that I think are surprising to a lot of people when they hear about it. Um, the first is, I think a lot of people just assume that countries, the U.S., countries around the world, have always had rules about who could enter their territory. Um, but that's just not true. Um, in the case of the United States, the, the U.S. had no federal immigration laws um, until 1875. Um, so almost 100 years after the Declaration of Independence, there were no federal rules about who could enter the territory of the country. Um, and I think that surprises a lot of people. They don't, they don't know about that history. Um, the Constitution actually prohibits any limits on immigration to the United States until 1808. Um, that rule was, was predominantly about uh, slavery. It was about allowing slavery to continue, and so there wouldn't be any limits on the importation of slaves, but it also bans any immigration rules as well. Um, after 1808, a number of states 
um, tried to make their own immigration rules. Um, Massachusetts, where, where many of you are, Massachusetts comes up over and over again in the, the story that we're going to tell today. So um, we'll, we'll hear lots of local connections for sure. Um, but Massachusetts is one of the first states to try to implement its own immigration rules. Um, so because Boston and New York were the primary ports where people coming from Europe were arriving in the US in the early decades. Um, and so Boston wanted to prevent the arrival of the destitute poor um, and people who were sick or insane. Um, and so they tried to implement their own rules. Um, New York did the same. Some Southern states tried to implement rules about free Blacks coming to their ports um, during the, the era of slavery. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled in 1849 in what are called the passenger cases. Um, and then again in 1875 in relation to some, some cases in California um, that immigration was solely the issue of the federal government. So these state level restrictions um, were invalid. Um, and so through 1875, there were no federal immigration laws. Um, it's not until the Chinese start to arrive um, that the first laws come into being. So you note this change from an early republic where there really were no uh, strict immigration laws or quotas <clears throat> of the kind that we understand them today till gradually first at the state level and then at the federal level, um, these systems become both more formalized and more draconian. And as you just said, some of that was in response merely to volume, right? As the numbers of potential immigrants increase. But you also say a bit about how ideas about racial difference, ideas about social value are playing into this as well. Tell us about some of the 19th century concepts about race, nationality, economy, and society that are flowing into the political conversation about how to create some of these laws in the 19th century. Yeah, I think to understand that, the, we have to also think about citizenship rules. Um, so the US didn't have immigration laws um, through 1875 at the federal level, but from the start um, in the first um, uh, Congress, they did pass rules about who could become a citizen of the United States. Um, and the naturalization law of 1790 limited that to free white persons um, who had resided in the US for two years. Um, so there were rules of who could be a member of the society, but not rules about who could enter. Um, so in the book, um, I talk, I, I identify the period after the Civil War as this key moment of transition, where there's this um, rethinking of who belongs in the US and how to manage that. Um, and it's in reaction to Black citizenship. After the Civil War, of course, um, with the end of slavery and um, the 14th, 15th Amendment, 13th, 14th Amendments, um, and the naturalization laws that followed, by 1870, freed slaves could become citizens of the United States. Um, but they weren't just welcomed, right? I think that we can see three primary reactions of the white population to this idea of black citizenship, which I think many um, at the time hadn't anticipated and didn't necessarily support. Um, the first of those reactions is violence. Um, in the aftermath of Reconstruction, we see the, the Ku Klux Klan, um, but we also see um, Jim Crow laws, segregation as a system that kind of reimposes the white order that had started to slip away. The second thing we see is efforts to remove free non-white people from the United States. Um, there was a group called the American Colonization Society, which was started in the 18 teens um, to have a system to move freed slaves back to Africa. Um, the country of Liberia is, is set up for this purpose. After the Civil War, that effort picks up um, and continues through the 20th century, I think much later than a lot of people often realize. Um, the American Colonization Society wasn't disbanded until 1964. Um, in the 1930s, uh, there were efforts in the Senate to pass a Greater Liberia Act, which would have removed all African Americans from the country um, within 20 years. It, it, of course, did not pass. Um, but the third reaction is the one that I'm focused on in the book, and that's the effort to not allow any more non-white people to come to the United States. Um, and so we see this effort starting in the 1870s to implement 
immigration laws that would prevent the arrival of more non-white people to kind of protect this idea of white citizenship in the US. Um, and, and it's the Chinese arriving on the West Coast that are the first of these groups to face this racial exclusion. In addition to the Chinese, there's, of course, nationalities from around the world that are trying to enter the United States uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And, you know, the concept of whiteness plays a crucial role in your book, um, plays a crucial role in the heads of the politicians who are trying to use whiteness as an arbiter of who is welcome and who is unwelcome. But how does that get constructed? How do people emigrating from China, which is politically fragmented at the time, Southeast Asia, South Asia, all around the world. How does the construction of whiteness appear and who, who gets determined to be white? And by contrast, who gets determined to be non-white? Yeah. the So the first immigration law, we've kind of hinted at the first ones. We haven't actually said with what they were, right? Um, the first immigration laws were the Chinese Exclusion Acts, right? So in 1875, the U.S. passes the Page Act. It's the first immigration law in the U.S. that bans Chinese laborers and women from coming to the U.S. Um, and then in 1882, um, because this 1875 Act had some loopholes in it, um, the Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, which excludes all people from China from coming to the United States. Um, and it has a, an immediate effect. Um, the number of people arriving goes from tens of thousands um, down to just less than 10 um, people in the years after the imposition of that act. Um, and across the West, there's violence towards people of Chinese origin as well. Um, what, what we would today probably call ethnic cleansing, um, where um, towns across the West, the white populations band together um, and force the Chinese people out of their, their towns. They go to the, the Chinatowns in the large cities or back to China or to Canada and Mexico. Um, in 1880, there were 100,000 Chinese people in the United States. By 1920, um, which was a period of time where the U.S. population as a whole doubled, um, the number of Chinese people had declined to 60,000. So, um, so there's this really concerted effort to remove Chinese people. Um, in terms of defining race and whiteness, um, I think that's crucial during this period of time um, because we see both the violence of Jim Crow, which creates this hierarchy of whiteness on the top, um, but also these immigration laws, which are predicated on the idea that white is a superior race to other races around the world. Um, and here is where Boston um, and Massachusetts starts to really enter this story even more, um, because a lot of the, the race science that's produced at universities is produced in Boston. Um, it's at MIT and it's at Harvard where the leading thinkers of this era are writing books about who is white and defining whiteness um, and arguing that whites are superior to other people around the world. Some key figures are Francis Walker, who is the president of MIT. Um, he, he works with the idea that white people breed less than other races around the world. And so um, the, that produces the threat of race suicide, um, which Teddy Roosevelt um, takes up as kind of a mantle of, of why there needs to be um, immigration restrictions. Um, William Ripley was also an MIT professor. He writes a book called The Races of Europe that comes out in, uh, I believe, 1899, um, which in, in this framing, it's not just that white is superior to Asian or African peoples, but also that there are classifications within Europe. Um, and so in this framing, it's the people of Northern Europe that are the superior white race um, and the Central Europeans and Mediterranean peoples are even lesser than, than that. Um, and so a lot of the arguments that we see in the start of the 20th century about even more restrictions on immigration and particularly targeting people from Italy, for example, or Southern and Eastern Europe, are justified by these academic theories of racial superiority, um, eugenics, racial pseudoscience that are produced at MIT and Harvard um, at the turn of the century. 
And a lot of that quote unquote science that you mentioned, you, you refer to the term breeding. There's a strong relationship to the growing biological sciences of the day, right? It's almost a agricultural metaphor. The term stock um, becomes very closely associated with racial difference. And that in turn plays into ideas about the cultivating the people of, of, of the United States, right? Tell us a bit about how uh, a scientific, you know, the scientific enterprise is really implicated in this process, ideas about human difference, uh, constructing themselves into ideas about racial difference, and then those ideas about kind of tending a society or improving a society, resolving into eugenic ideas about breeding and reproduction, and then, you know, the arrival of, of, of different races into the United States. What, what, is, what is science doing in all of this? Yeah, the, this was something that an, another thing that I learned while researching this book that I didn't really understand, which is the relationship between white supremacy and environmental conservation. Um, this is something that comes up over and over again in the book. Um, so we see it first in this era that you're, you're referring to now. Um, but again, in the 1970s and 80s, um, there's a strong overlap between environmental protection movements and white supremacist movements, um, which is something I hadn't understood um, prior to working on the book. Um, I think a figure that, that represents this in the earlier era um, is uh, Madison Grant, um, who is he's moving in the same circles of um, uh, the the of New England or the up or the the Northeast, but he's from New York. Um, but he writes a book called "The Passing of the Great Race," um, which comes out in 1916. Um, this book sells over a million copies. Um, it gets referenced on the Senate floor when they're talking about the 1924 immigration laws that implement these eugenics-inspired rules about who can enter the U.S. Um, it's a book also that influenced Hitler. Um, said to have um, written Grant a letter calling the book his Bible, um, but for sure a copy of the book was found in, um, in Hitler's bunker in, at the end of World War II when he committed suicide. Um, so Madison Grant, though, was an environmentalist. His earlier work was on protecting endangered species in the West. So um, he recognized that species like the American bison were under threat, um, and he felt like the only way to protect that was to create these protected areas, national parks, um, where they couldn't be hunted and they could survive without these threats from other places. Um, what he does in The Passing of the Great Race is to make that same analogy in terms of immigration restrictions and races. Um, and so he builds on um, the book um, of the, the races of Europe by Ripley that I talked about previously um, and uses that to argue that the Northern Europeans who are very predominant in the US are the white man par excellence. That's a direct quote from his book. Um, and he feels like the only way to protect the white race in America from these threats of other races around the world is through strict immigration laws that allow only Northern Europeans to come to the US and prevent everyone else from entering. One thing I'm curious about, is, as, you know, as you've noted here, and I think made a very persuasive case to show that racial distinction in immigration laws is kind of wo woven all throughout American history. In some ways, it's the norm for American history to have uh, uh, baked these pseudoscientific racial ideas into its immigration policies. And there's a way in which the, you know, post 9-11 security state and culminating in the Trump presidency, I think you, you quite accurately shows in some ways a reversion to a, to a horrible mean. What that made me wonder about is what, how do we account for the brief moment of relatively liberal immigration policies in the mid 20th century? You talk about how that came out of the post-war era. You talk about people like the Kennedys and, and, and their role in, in pushing um, a, a, this moment of, of immigration liberalization. But I was left wondering why? What, you know, what, what, what was the reason for that other than a kind of enlightened, you know, they had the right idea kind of thing. Um, 
as we think about how might we rearticulate a more universalist or a more uh, a more open uh, or non-racialized immigration regime, how did how did we get to a, a, a time when that was the case? If it is in fact the exceptional state, um, as contrasted to a long and brutal norm of racial exclusion. The period, I, I think first the, the 1924 law, we should highlight that a little bit more. It's, um, it really is kind of the culmination of this racial pseudoscientific period. Um, and it creates these, what's, what are called national origins quotas that essentially means only people from Northern Europe can come to the US. Um, and it's trumpeted that way. The, um, you know, the, the LA Times has a headline, Nordic victory. Um, the New York Times runs a front page article that the era of the melting pot has come to an end, right? So, um, so it's that, that law stays in place um, through 1965. Um, but what we see though, are some changes in the decades after that. So um, one change is the, um, the reaction to the culmination of the Nazi regime. Um, so I mentioned Hitler liked Madison Grant's book. Um, Hitler also liked the 1924 immigration law. Um, he, in Mein Kampf, cites that law in the US as the model that Germany should follow um, in terms of racial exclusion and the protection of the pure white race. Um, so, of course, he takes that to the grisly extent with the Holocaust and the killing of millions of people. Um, and in the aftermath of that, people who had supported these eugenics ideas previously start to disavow them um, at the same time that in universities, um, that pseudoscience of the turn of the century is disproved and it falls out of favor. Um, so on the one hand, we've got the, the end of World War II is kind of a turning away from um, this fascist idea of racial exclusion um, that, that the Nazi regime symbolized. Um, at the same time in the US, we see the civil rights movement. Um, so, and I think the, the organizing of the civil rights movement is crucial to um, changing some of these rules. Um, so it's not until 1952 that that phrase free white person is actually removed from the naturalization law. Um, so that's within the lifetime of probably some of the people who are listening to this right now, that in order to be naturalized as a citizen, you either had to be a free white person or a person of African origin um, whose ancestors were, were freed slaves. Um, so it's only in 1952 that that's finally removed. Um, the immigration law changes in 1965. Um, and I think we have to look at the, um, the 1964 Civil Rights Act as a key part of that, because the Civil Rights Act says that the American government can't discriminate based on race, religion, or national origin. Um, but the immigration law specifically discriminated based on national origin. And so um, the revision to that became part of that larger package of civil rights laws. Um, and again, we see key figures from Massachusetts playing a role in that. Um, so John F. Kennedy had written the book, A Nation of Immigrants um, in the 50s and in the 1960s, his two brothers, um, RFK and Teddy um, Kennedy take up the mantle um, and bring this immigration law over the line. Um, so in 1965, they get rid of those national origin quotas and they replace it with a different set of criteria about who can enter the United States. Um, in some ways, it's racially more progressive, um, but in other ways, it still attempts to do what the previous laws were doing. Um, in the negotiations about this law, um, there was a belief that they didn't want to create a law that would open up and change the racial composition of the country. Um, Teddy Kennedy says this on the Senate floor. He says, this law will not um, change the, the, uh, the, I lost the quote in my head, but um, he said it won't flood our cities with immigrants. It won't change the racial composition of our country. Um, and the way that they had hoped to keep the racial composition was through giving most of the, the visas in the 1965 immigration law to family reunifications. Um, so the way it works is if you are an American citizen, you can bring your brother, your sister, your children, your parents to the US with immigration visas. Um, in 1965, 
90% of the US population was still white. Um, and the idea was that that would mean these family reunifications would be 90% people who were ethnically white. Um, but that turned out to not be the case because most of the white population had been in the US for decades and didn't have a brother or a mother in their former country, whereas newer immigrants who tended to be from different parts of the world did. Um, and so in the decades since 1965, there has been a much more diverse immigration to the United States, um, even if that was not the intent of that law. It's interesting that you note some of the political slippages here, whether it's the Kennedys trying to reassure Americans that the racial composition of the United States will not be unbalanced. And throughout the story, you know, there's a small number of what we might call sort of moral clarity figures, uh, you know, George Frisbee Hoare of Massachusetts, who was an early opponent of um, really, a, really an opponent of racial discrimination writ large. Um, but those are in the minority. And of course, Hoare was a Northeastern Republican. The Republican Party at the time was strongly pro-imperialist, strongly in favor of Philippine, the annexation of the Philippines and uh, basically an apartheid regime there. And on the other side, you see labor leaders coming out strongly in favor of racially distinguished immigration laws. You see um, a kind of class politics around immigration, white, working class and poor people fearing um, cheap labor. And so uh, as much as it might be tempting to kind of read today's politics all the way back through history and saying that one, you know, there was a side that kind of understood the just and moral uh, uh, argument for universal immigration and another side that was deeply racist, it turns out in fact to be highly complicated, the political uh, valences of the past. So how, how, how do we think about the ways in which the politics around race, immigration, nationality, class have woven their way all the way up to the present day and retained some of these ambiguities and complexities? Yeah. So George Frisbee, who, or he's someone I didn't know about, right? I'm not from Massachusetts. I had never heard of him previously, um, but he did give these really amazing speeches in 1882 opposing the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, he talked about how, um, in his view, all humans should have the right to move freely across the space of the earth. Um, so he's essentially taking a, a no borders position um, on the Senate floor. And he talks, he also gives another speech where he's talking about how um, the US should judge immigrants by their character and not by the color of their skin, um, a, a line that kind of evokes Martin Luther King's um, March on Washington speech, which comes 80 years later. Um, so yeah, he's he is kind of a has has some moral clarity during that moment. Um, on the other hand, though, I definitely in the book was surprised how many similarities there were between these different eras in terms of the ways that immigrants were described. Um, you could read the speeches um, of the people who want to limit Chinese immigration in the 1882 Act, um, and they sound a lot like Republicans do today. Um, the language is about the Chinese as an great invasion force um, that are unarmed but coming to, to take over um, the, the United States and to displace the white population. Um, the Chinese are described as hardworking and taking American jobs, while at the same time lowering wages for American workers. The Chinese are said to bring uh, vices Opium at the time, of course, was the main issue across the border. So they're they're drug they're drug smugglers. Um, they're also bringing diseases that are infecting the white population um, with them. So it's the exact same language we hear today at the U.S. Mexico border um, when um, people on the right talk about the threat of immigration there. It's it's the same language about the same sorts of threats. Um, we also see, I think, some similarities in this idea of. Uh, replacement that comes up over and over again in these different eras. I, I previously mentioned Teddy Roosevelt talking about race suicide, right? So his argument was that the white population wasn't breeding at the same rate as immigrants were, um, and that it, by allowing more immigrants into the country, it would be the suicide of the white race. 
Um, someone like Tucker Carlson today, um, just over the last few weeks, has been using almost identical language to talk about immigration and race. Um, Tucker Carlson, in reaction to the, the last census, which showed the first ever decline in the number of people in the US that um, identify first as, as white, um, and we can raise questions about that because probably that decline is because people decided to mark white and something else, right, rather than just white. But he he called that the extinction of the white race um, as, as what that represented. And he talks a lot about how Democrats want to replace whites with immigrants um, as their strategy. So, um, so although the maybe the positions of the people saying it have switched through history. Um, the language that they've used to talk about immigration has really surprisingly stayed very similar across many of these eras. Um, as, you, as you suggested before, it's really only in the post-civil uh, rights movement, so late 1960s through the early 2000s, that saying these racist things about immigration um, falls out of favor, right? So it really is a very brief period of time where it's not appropriate to talk about immigrants in these terms. Um, but then over the rest of the history of the US, there is a lot of continuity in how non-white immigration is discussed um, in, in, in politics and in the media. I want to ask one last question, um, and then we've got some some questions from the audience as well. And uh, again, uh, remind our audience members, please uh, feel free to write in. Uh, you can ask a question about what you've heard, a question about what you've read in the book, or a question that um, is on this topic generally. We'd love to hear from you all. Reese, I'm, I, I think you uh, have persuaded all of us that racial difference is deeply enmeshed in the project of immigration control and of restricting mobility across national borders. How do we reconcile that with the fact that so much of our life is still organized territorially? And I mean that both in the mundane sense, right? The, Bo the Boston Public Library is funded by the taxpayers of Boston, which is defined as the people who live or work within a magic line around the city of Boston, you know the state, the laws of Massachusetts, uh, which the state library uh, is is one of the guardians of, pertain within the borders of Massachusetts and not outside of them, and of course national sovereignty remains the primary way of organizing global politics. A nation state has power within its borders and doesn't have power outside of them. How do we what does a what does a politics look like in which those territorial geometries of power, representation, democracy, citizenship still hold, but which might move away from the essentially racialized project of border making that you described so compellingly? So in some ways, that's what some of my previous books have looked at and, and considered. Um, I think the way you framed it is really important for thinking about these issues. Um, you know, right now you all are in, or presumably many of you are in Massachusetts and in Boston. Um, you pay taxes there. You follow the laws of that state, um, and uh, you are residents. You have a, you know, a, a citizenship document that says you're a resident of that state. Um, but at the same time, you are free to move to Hawaii, where I live, right? But if you moved here, you would pay taxes here, you would follow the laws here, um, and you would bound be a resident of this, this place, right? So um, I think when we think about how the global system could work, um, we can think of it in a lot of ways like that. Um, there's really no reason that we need to restrict who can cross an uh, international political border um, in the same way that we have no rules in the US of how people can, can cross state borders, right? Um, there, there's really no difference between those things. Um, and so what I can imagine in a, a idealized future, um, and as I suggested before, it's not a completely unprecedented future because there was long periods of time where this was possible um, in, in the history of the world. And it's something that someone like George Frisbee Hoare advocated for in the 1880s on the US Senate um, is a world where people are free to enter the United States. But if they do, they pay taxes here, they abide by the rules here, um, and they, um, they can become a member of this community. Um, I think that that's the, the future world we should try to envision. Um, and I would suggest that the more radical position 
is the one that the US should exclude people based on their race and their identity. Um, and that they should do that with violence, right? That people who show up at the border should be subject to the violence of the state, should be attacked by border patrol agents on horseback, um, should be funneled to very dangerous places to cross the border, which results in these huge number of migrant deaths. Um, I would say that that's the more radical position and the position that probably people 100 years in the future will look back on and wonder how we could abide by such a, um, a violent and terrible system. Thanks, Professor Jones. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions from the audience, some of which I'm going to uh, more or less read verbatim, and there's a few others that I'm going to sort of combine uh, uh, and hybridize. Um, one question uh, asks about whether you think border control remains relaxed uh, during an expansionist period. So thinking about the first hundred years of the United States, when of course we we haven't spoken much in this conversation yet about uh, American Indians and indigenous people, um, you know, the racial difference between white and indigenous was a huge lever of American citizenship policy. Um, but as you know, it was also a time of relatively relaxed immigration laws. And so the, the, the question is, do you think that border control is relaxed at a time that a country is expanding, that has free land? And then once a, the country is full, so to speak, then the stakes of immigration control become higher? Um. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept the idea that any country is full. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I would dispute that from the start. But I think that the, the um, question is uh, a good one because it highlights the fact that there was this era where the US wasn't worried at all about patrolling its borders, right? I mean, it started out 13 colonies um, on the Eastern seaboard. Um, and so for a century or 75 years, at least, it's expanding out, right? It's the, um, you know, purchasing Florida, purchasing Louisiana purchase, um, making the border with Canada and at the time the UK, um, and then the war with Mexico um, in 1848 is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that takes a third of Mexico's territories and incorporates it into the United States. Um, I think the key thing, and, and it's exactly what the questioner is, is identifying, is that when this period is happening, um, the immigration that is occurring to the US is predominantly a white Northern European immigration, um, and that's encouraged. Um, but at the same time, there's still slavery continuing, that's this racial exclusion. Um, and when the US takes over these new territories moving to the West, um, they don't welcome in Native Americans or former Mexican citizens. Um, instead, there's a cleansing of these places, right? I mean, it is a violent destruction of the people who previously lived, lived there and forcing those people out of those spaces, right? So. Um, so that period of expansion is not this period where it's suddenly welcoming all these people who lived in those places. I mean, no, right? It's a, um, it's an extermination of many of the people in those places. Um, in the book, uh, I talk about um, a senator from Oregon, um, who his name is Lafayette Grover, um, and he uh, he was formerly the governor of Oregon, and then he's in the Senate when the Chinese Exclusion Acts are being debated. Um, and his argument in in 1882 is look, our ancestors used fire and sword to conquer this area and create it for their white progeny. So why would we ever want to allow more non-white people to come here and change that, which they worked so hard to create over those early decades, right? So essentially his argument was, we've already ethnically cleansed this land, why would we let more immigrants come into this place? I mean, it's a shocking argument, um, but it's exactly the argument that was resonating um, at the time of Chinese exclusion. So um, yeah, so I think the, the questioner is right to make connections to that, um, that period. Another audience member asks, uh, says race scholars have criticized the black white binary when talking about race in the United States and noting that certain races have confounded or lay on opposite sides of that line at different times, periods of time. Did any of this manifest in immigration and migration laws? Definitely. Um, so in the book, I talk about this period where 
Um, white is a category that's still up for dispute, right? So in 1790, the, the citizenship law said free white person, um, but it didn't define what that meant. Um, and so um, in the 1880s through the 1920s, um, I talk about a series of court cases um, that rise through lower courts and eventually reach the Supreme Court, where people are applying for citizenship in the US and saying, I should be counted as white, right? And so the courts essentially have to adjudicate, what does white mean, right? And so in the book, I document that, you know, in 18, one, in one year, someone from Armenia is white. In the next year, they're not white. In one year, someone from Syria is white. In another year, they're not. Um, and in one year, people from India are white. In another year, they're not. Um, so eventually this reaches the Supreme Court um, in 1922 and 1923. Uh, there are two main cases. The first is Takeo Ozawa, um, who is a man from Japan, um, who argues that Japanese people have quite light colored skin, pretty white. Um, so by if the definition is white skin, then he qualifies. Um, but in addition to that, he has lived in the US for decades. He speaks English fluently. He should be a citizen of the country. And indeed, his children are citizens because the US has birthright citizenship. Um, so when they're born in the US, they become citizens automatically. And so he argues that he should be too. Um, but the Supreme Court rules no, um, that uh, free white person means Caucasian. Um, and then another case in 1923 follows quickly upon that, um, which is the case of um, uh, Bhagat Sind, Pind, um, who, who argues that, well, he's Aryan because he's from North India. And so Aryan is Caucasian, so he should be able to become a citizen. But the Supreme Court, again, narrows that definition of who counts as white um, and says, no, it, what we really mean are the common understanding of someone with white skin from Northern Europe. Um, and so after 1923, the, the definition of white in a legal sense has narrowed quite dramatically. Um, and many people who had previously been granted citizenship based on lower courts lose it um, based on this much more narrow definition. Um, and so, like I said, it's not till 1952 that that has changed. Another audience member asks, are there countries in the world that have no immigration restrictions at all? I assume they mean today, but uh, maybe historically as well. Um, so Ecuador in their constitution has a clause that says that there should be free movement um, for all human beings. Um, so that would be one example of it. Um, you could also look at the European Union having free internal movement um, during the Schengen era, which um, of course COVID um, has affected a little bit um, during the last few years. Um, so that'd be another example though of countries allowing free movement between each other um, in, in that sense. Um, so yes, there are, there are examples of that. Um, there are also a number of countries that allow essentially most anyone to enter. You just have to show up at the border, have a passport and you can come into the country. Um, tourist focused countries like a, a Thailand or Jamaica tend to have rules like that. They're very flexible on who can enter their territory. Another participant asks about uh, their reading of Erica Lee's book at America's Gates in which uh, Erica Lee argues that Chinese exclusion failed because Chinese immigrants and returning residents and citizens of Chinese descent figured out and deployed all sorts of ways to get around the restrictions on immigration and they did so with considerable success. Uh, you seem to be saying something different. Could you elaborate on this uh, or what accounts for the, the, the sort of shifting fates of, of Chinese exclusion? Yeah, I mean, Erica Lee is definitely right that there were a whole range of ways that people got around these exclusions. So um, the 1882 law excluded new people from coming, but people who were already in the US were able to stay and they had documents that allowed that. Um, there was also the, a period where um, there was the a destruction of a, um, a, a record of that sort of information. Um, and so um, like, I think there was a fire in the building that, that carried that information. And so then after that, people could produce documents and claim that they had been in the US prior to that date. So, um, so there certainly is um, are examples of that. But to me, the, the 
I would probably dispute the overall thesis that it had no effect, um, just based on that that number of um, you know the the decline and the number of people of Chinese origin over that era, um, and the the real prevention of new people able to come. Um, so I think as an overall thing, it worked. Um, sadly to say, um, but certainly there were ways to get around it and lots of people did do that. Reese, I want to ask one final question, which is a bit of an amalgam of several people's questions, uh, which are all sort of variants on the where do we go from here question, right? Noting the not only the Trump era restrictions on immigration, but also fears since the beginning of the pandemic around restriction of movement. Um, economic deglobalization in, in certain ways. What would a popular political movement in favor of a more universal mobility regime look like? And how might that avoid the trap of simply falling into a kind of capitalist globalization, you know, free money, free people, free borders uh, sort of ideology? What, what would it look like? What would you uh, advocate for in building a resilient democratic political movement that looks different from these dominant racial regimes of immigration in the past. Yeah, the this is a, something that again that that my previous books get more into than this particular book does. Um, but what I've argued for in the past is a world where there is free movement where people are free to move from one place to another so that we don't have these strict rules about immigration, um, but instead accept the fact that uh, movement is a fundamental human right. Um, it's already recognized in the UN's Declaration of Human Rights as a fundamental human right, um, but it does have this one caveat that countries can restrict it at their borders. Um, but if you really stop and think about it, it doesn't really make a ton of sense why that one particular location people can't be free to move but it's a fundamental human right that they're able to move on every other space uh, on earth, right? The, the global community treats countries that restrict internal movements as human rights violators, right? And so I think that um, we need to start to think about that movement at the global scale as similar, right? As something that's just fundamentally what humans should be able to do, um, that where you're born shouldn't determine your ability to move across the face of the earth. Um, but Garrett, you're right to suggest that just that alone isn't going to solve every issue that we face in the world, right? It would solve a lot of issues fairly immediately, right? I mean, migrant deaths would go down substantially. The idea of human smuggling would be much less of a concern. Um, the, um, so, uh, and it would also improve the fates of many people in terms of their economic um, livelihoods um, after that. Um, economic scholars suggest that they would have this dramatic impact on global GDP um, to allow the free movement of people, that it's really a restriction on, on the global economics of the world to have movement restrictions on the poor. Um, in my previous work though, I connect that to a couple of other things. Um, the first of those is uh, some notion of a global minimum wage, right? That, that um, there needs to be some sort of of basic standard that doesn't allow this race to the bottom that we have today, right? So what's happened over the last 60 years in this era that we call globalization is that the poor of the rest of the world are contained where they live by border restrictions and creates these weighed these pools of low wage labor. Um, but at the same time, workers in the US and Europe have also seen their wages decline in real terms and many of them can move across borders. They can go wherever they want to, um, whereas regulators um, and the poor are contained, right? And so um, creating a system where there are global minimum wages, um, there are global corporate tax systems, um, which there's some effort to do that right now going on, so that's a positive step, um, would help to build that, right? So there would be less pressure on people to move from where they currently live to seek better wages elsewhere, but also um, on corporations to move to these other places to exploit the, the poor in the way that they are. Um, 
in some of my previous work, I've kind of connected our current era to the, the Gilded Age in terms of the way that the economics in the US was working, right? So in the 1880s, 1890s, um, corporations operating in the US could pay whatever wages they wanted, work in whatever conditions they wanted, and it was horrible for workers, right? And the worker protections that emerge in the decades after that um, in terms of minimum wages, um, worker protections, um, weekends, things like that, create a much better situation for workers in the US. That's all been undone, though, by corporations now being able to move to other places um, where those sorts of rules don't exist. So um, a regime of free movement also needs to be connected to a regime of expanding these basic protections for workers um, on a global scale. Um, and uh, uh, the third thing that I talk about, um, and this is, in, again, in my book, Vile Importers, um, is to talk about global environmental protections as well as kind of a key aspect of that, to not tie environmental protections to the bounded territories of states, but rather to have much more global rules. Um, and I think those three things combined together could create, move us in some ways towards a better, more free and a, a safer world for people. Reese, thanks so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground, both conceptually, historically, geographically. Um, I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Again, Professor Reese Jones of the University of Hawaii is most recently the author of White Borders. Um, and we'll have some more details about where you can find or purchase the book later. Um, I want to invite my colleagues from the Boston Public Library and the State Library of Massachusetts back uh, as we wrap up today's program. And Reese, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, I know everybody's really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks again. At the Leventhal Center, uh, I would love to invite all of you who are nearby to come visit us. We, our exhibition gallery is open six days a week in the Central Library and our current exhibition, Bending Lines, Maps and Data from Distortion to Deception, deals with the tricks that maps can play, including amongst other things, drawing borders where they didn't belong before, where they've newly been created, dividing nations, dividing territories, and sometimes becoming more real than the reality itself. Uh, you can visit Bending Lines both in the gallery and online at leventhalmap.org. I'll turn it over now to the next slide, which I believe is Beth. Great. Well, thank you to both of our speakers tonight. I'm glad you were able to finally meet each other uh, virtually through this event. Uh, the issue of immigration, as we, if we didn't know before tonight, I'll understand much better affects pretty much every other issue that the Commonwealth's governing bodies have been making decisions about since the 17th century. And all of that is very well documented in the State Library's collections. And through your work, both of you, uh, we've learned a, a lot about the history of immigration and it's given us a lot to think about, especially what we've talked about tonight. So I hope that both of our speakers and all of you in the audience tonight will feel welcome to visit us at the State Library after the State House reopens. In the meantime, we're providing services virtually and uh, we're happy to help you with any questions that you have. You can see on the slide that's up right now that our collections cover a wide variety of formats and topics, although most of our, our holdings document Massachusetts history and government. So we have a large amount of material relating to the Commonwealth and including immigration, and much of it is available through our digital repository. So you're welcome to contact us with any questions you may have about our holdings. Um, there's a the link to our website, mass.gov slash LIV will take you to our homepage where you'll find all sorts of information. So on the next screen, you'll see that we have two more events coming up in November. Uh, we're also planning our programming for the end of the year and for early next year. So please do keep an eye on our website for information about that. So on Thursday, November 4th at 1 p.m., and please do note this is a different time from our usual author events. We're joining our colleagues at American Ancestors again for a presentation by culinary historian Ann Willen on her book, Women in the Kitchen, 
12 essential cookbook writers who define the way we eat from 1661 to today. And she'll be in conversation with the longtime award-winning food editor of the Boston Globe, Cheryl Julian. Then on Monday, November 22nd, at 7 p.m., we'll join our colleagues at the Tewksbury Public Library and other Massachusetts libraries to hear from author and artist Barry Van Dusen about his book, Finding Sanctuary, an Artist Explores the Nature of Mass Audubon. And I, I got my copy of this book yesterday, and I can assure you that the images are just gorgeous, as well as the message. So we hope you can join us for both of these events. And many thanks to all of you for being here tonight. So Kristen, we'll go back to you for some final comments from the Boston Public Library. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Garrett, for that very important conversation. Before we close for the evening, I do just wanna share one more time where you can get a copy of White Borders. We do have some signed copies available and there is free media mail shipping if you use the coupon code BPL ship or check your own local public library as well to borrow from there. To find out about resources, services and programs at the Boston Public Library for all ages, uh, visit bpl.org or visit your local branch. And we'd love to see you in person. We are open. Um, three upcoming author talks that might be of interest on the next slide. Our next week, we have Larry Spotted Crowman here at the Central Library, but also virtually. Um, and then at the end of the month will be David Leonard, the BPL president, will actually be in conversation with Kyle T. Mays and his new book, An Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. So please join us for that. And then in December, in early December, Nora McInerney will also be here at the library, both in person and virtually by Zoom. So thank you for joining us so much this evening. Um, we hope to see you again soon, virtually or in person. Take care and good night.